Invitamos ahora al estado a Amy Cooper y Joan Robinson, quienes tienen a su cargo la ponencia Liderazgo de Sistemas, claves para maximizar la innovación en la educación. Amy Cooper es directora ejecutiva de Curriculum Services Canada. Amy ha sido profesora y comenzó su carrera de educación en Toronto, Canadá y enseñó también en la Junta Escolar de Osaka, en Japón. Tras dejar las aulas, Emi ha gestionado el desarrollo de múltiples programas de formación docente y una gran gama de proyectos de aprendizaje profesional internacionales en la Asociación de Dificultades del Aprendizaje en Ontario y Curriculum Services Canada. Es apasionada por el aprendizaje en el siglo XXI y está orgullosa del trabajo de Curriculum Services Canada quienes hacen tanto local como internacionalmente para apoyar a los educadores en su trabajo con los estudiantes para construir su carácter y habilidades para ser exitosos hoy en el futuro. La doctora Joan Robinson es directora ejecutiva de International School Leadership y directora de Professional Learning for Education en Canadá. Cuenta con vasta experiencia de desarrollo y liderazgo escolar y desempeñó un papel clave en la trayectoria de Ontario como una historia de éxito en su sistema educativo para la continua mejora de sus alumnos. Además dirigió el desarrollo del programa de cualificación de directores, el programa de cualificación de responsables de supervisión y un sinfín de otras iniciativas de desarrollo de liderazgo. Los dejamos entonces con las ponencias de Amy Cooper y Joan Robinson. see so many people at the conference today. I know that for some of you this might be holiday time and to spend your time learning and investing in your own future and the future of the students of Peru, I congratulate you for doing this. As was introduced, my name is Joanne Robinson and I'm really excited to be here presenting today with my colleague Amy Kapow. As the introducer mentioned, I really represent even though I have been a teacher and um, done most of the positions in education, most of the end of my career has been spent on leadership development. But one of the things that we're going to try and emphasize today is the fact that leadership exists throughout the system. Leadership is not just a position, it's not a title, it's a behavior. And that's what Amy and I are intending to do today, is to emphasize that cooperation that has to happen in the school, that collaborative culture. So our job today is to plant a few seeds. We like to use the analogy of a garden. Plant a few seeds and to um, have you start thinking about um, a little bit outside the box and make connections. I can't see as well as I thought I would here. <laughs> I'll just read it to you carefully. Our job this morning here is to plant a few seeds and motivate you to start thinking a little outside of your box and make connections to workshops over the next few days that you're going to experience where you will have an opportunity to go deeper into the learning on specific topics. In Ontario, where Amy and I both come from, We've been through a very steep learning curve. We're not at the top of the mountain yet, but we're getting there. And we want to emphasize that to get to near the top of our mountain of learning in education in Ontario, we had to pull out a few weeds in the garden and add a lot of fertilizer to the garden to get to where we are now. So we're excited to be here. Our job here is to share with you some of the most recent international research from OECD about the impact of school leadership working in schools and what that looks like and certainly some of the core leadership capacities and essential dimensions that have proven over time to have a sustained and prolonged positive impact on students and their learning environments. So, 
<laughs> this next slide we think is very important because it really emphasizes a consolidation of a lot of research that has happened globally. We grew up with uh, one of the professors in Ontario. His name is Dr. Ken Leadwood, and he has done a lot of work on leadership and defining leadership and the behaviors that leadership um, leads to improve student learning. And his work with the Wallace Foundation, as said there, leadership is second only to classroom instruction and all school related factors that contribute to. Uh, what students learn at school. And those of you in the room who are teachers, that's a commendation to you about the important work that you do. What it's saying is, you have the biggest impact. But more currently, research out of um, OECD, you may be familiar with the work of Andreas Schacher. <coughs> I had the privilege of hearing him speak at the International Summit of the Teaching Profession recently. And what he has said from a more global perspective, and I want you to be thinking about where you fit into this. Because principals can have an impact on student achievement, improving the quality of school leadership is more important than improving the quality of a single teacher's practice. Hmm, do you agree with that? Some of you may, some of you may not. But think about that. So, if we consider the impact of school leadership and what Andreas Schleicher say is saying about the quality of a single teacher's practice, it begs the question about what do we do together. And that's really why we're here today. Uh, when Joanne and I were talking about the Congress and speaking with Manuel, we were talking about the importance of innovation, the importance of working together, and we really wanted to demonstrate that by coming and speaking with you today on this topic to emphasize the importance of collaboration and the importance of the principal and the teacher working together. Now, Joanne and I are no longer in the role of principal or in the role of teacher, but we see that that spirit still applies in the work that we do today. Our organizations work directly with teachers and principals, and we know that we will both be more successful if we work together. So that's a critical ingredient for us, and we wanted to do that with you today, because we know that when teachers and principals work together, that's when the most fantastic things happen for kids. And we heard that emphasized when we heard from the minister um, just minutes ago when he talked about both the importance of the role of teacher and principal. And we really feel that when both of those roles are fully enabled and empowered, that's when the greatest success happens. But I want to speak just briefly as well about innovation because this is the first time that Joanne and I have stood up at a podium and done this together. And you'll hear us talk and it will be a theme in our work together over the next few days to talk about innovation and to talk about experimentation. And so we have to challenge ourselves to do something different. We're all used to seeing one person stand up here and there will be many times over the next few days where, you're, where you will hear that. But we wanted to see what might emerge from collaborating together in the development of this presentation and collaborating together in working with you because that's where new ideas and new possibilities emerge. The next thing I would like to uh, share with you, and it's, it's a little bit of an explanation or a validation of why Amy and I would be invited to speak to you. We're from Ontario, and if you will follow the P's of things, you would know that Ontario and Canada is one of the countries like Finland where our students do pretty well. We haven't always done that well. Let me reassure you, we're only about 12 or 14 years into our students doing very well on the global scale. It's been a lot of hard work. As I said before, it's uh, planting seeds in gardens and pulling out a lot of weeds along the way. But what I would like to emphasize in this slide is, and these slides come from our Ministry of Education, by the way, they're not Joanne's slides or Amy's slides. They came from our, the work that is done by our ministry. And we have a standardized testing process, and it's, uh, it's very much like a unit of study. 
So it's criteria, more criterion reference. But what I wanted to emphasize here is that these are our elementary results. So for us, that means um, actually grade one through grade eight, which is I know different than your system. We have the standardized test in grade three and grade six. And I'm sharing this with you because if this is a government slide and you can see that once we declare in Ontario a crisis, and I was very much in the middle and thick of things of the um, ministry's announcement, we have a problem and we've got to do something about it because our students weren't doing very well. You can see over there that um, the scores in 2002-03 were abysmal. But what's the response to that kind of a crisis? What happens when we recognize we have a problem? And the whole solution is in that word, we. And the research from our government has been that we all have to contribute to the, the reform. We all have to contribute. And what I want to emphasize again from our Minister of Education is that whole notion of how did we improve and the four qualities that are there on the side, what caused that? So classroom teaching, duh. If you want to improve kids' learning, you have to improve teaching and accommodate needs of students. And improving class school effectiveness. So we have very much a whole school effectiveness framework that we're, is guiding our action. But the one that was most important to me in the work that I've been doing, developing leaders across the system, is that third one, leadership capacity building. And by that, I want to emphasize that it's about building capacity, not the position called principal or headmaster or head teacher. It's about nurturing those qualities of leadership that lead to improved student learning, and that's across the system. The other one that I think makes us unique compared to many other countries has been that most of the work that we have done is founded in research. We used to have a program, and I would always describe it as whatever shiny new car drove down the street in education, we chase that car. Whole language, all kinds of new things for teaching. We would chase that car. Now we're very strategic and purposeful. If something has the research that goes with it, that can demonstrate this is worth pursuing, then we do go after it. But other than that, we don't chase all the shiny cars anymore. It saved everybody a lot of time, energy, and money. So that's, those were our elementary results, and very similar, our secondary results. This is very raw data. Kids start secondary school in grade nine. Four years later, and we give them one year um, leeway, we call it the victory lap, one extra year to finish. But four years later, how many kids who started in grade nine actually graduated? They stuck with it, they got their diploma, they got all of their credits, and you can see, again, continuous growth in the number of graduates. What causes that? And again, research right out of our own Ministry of Education, number one on the list is leadership, and leadership infrastructure. And it has changed the way our leaders at every level behave. And that's our job today. That's what we're going to emphasize today is that the more we work together, the more it's a shared responsibility, the better our students will do. The next slide <coughs> is a graphic, we'll call it, that demonstrates that. Again, out of our own government, but we have emphasized <coughs> that leadership and capacity building related to instruction. It's not enough to have good principals who know how to build a good budget or how to keep strong discipline in their school. We're talking about leadership and capacity building related to instruction. 
So focus and alignment and coherence. Those are the kinds of things that uh, we've been emphasizing in our system. So hopefully you can see that uh, in our talk today, we're emphasizing the importance of leadership being distributed across a school, across a larger educational organization. And leaders can be found everywhere. So you have been sitting and listening for some time this morning, and we'd like to break that up a little bit and just have you turn to your neighbor for a moment and reflect on, in your school, or perhaps other educational institution or context, where do you see leaders? And these leaders may have a leadership title or a leadership role, or you may see people who are being leaders in any of their roles. So take a moment, if you will, please, just to turn to the person sitting next to you and talk about where you see leaders in your organization. Okay, if I can ask you just to conclude your conversation, please. Thank you. So, by a show of hands, raise your hand, please, if you identify at least one person who demonstrates leadership who does not have a formal leadership role or title. Who could think of a leader in your organization whose title or role does not say leader? So maybe about a third or a half of the room. So I, I'd like to leave you with one challenge, which is I think you are all about to return shortly from your vacations. When you return to your school or your organization, observe if you can see anyone else in the organization who shows leadership even without that role or title. And the reason we are talking about this is because it's not just important that people are demonstrating leadership in their roles. It's important that the leadership that we develop and practice is based on the values and the priorities of the system. So as a school, if you have identified a set of goals or priorities, anyone who is exercising leadership can be making a contribution towards the successful fulfillment of those goals. Right? And so let's talk a little bit about what effective leadership looks like. And I know our colleague Joni, who's coming after us, will be talking a little bit more, well, a lot more, really, about leadership. And so we just want to highlight a couple of important pieces about effective leadership in schools. Joanne highlighted already the importance of evidence-informed decisions. There are lots of different strategies, and I think you will hear about many of them over the next few days, uh, for gathering data, working within a school to review and learn from that data and be informed by that data as you move forward. And of course, as Joanne has highlighted already, instructional leadership of the principal. The principal plays that vital role Perhaps we can use the analogy of um, a conductor of an orchestra helping all of the teachers come together in moving forward on those school and system goals and priorities. And all of this needs to be tied back to helping our students succeed in school. Joanne talked a little bit about the Ontario story and I do think that one of the um, great enablers in that process was bringing everything back to student achievement. Does it help with student achievement? Then we know whether or not it's something that we should pursue and do we have the research to support it. One of the advantages that we have valued in Ontario is what we would call a system of exemplars. So one of the things that we have um, benefited from is very clear frameworks of what it is exceptional people do in the system. So we have a leadership framework, a very clear description of the things that effective leaders do, but we also have the same thing for our students. Our students' learning expectations 
both general and specific in the exemplars of what extraordinarily good work looks like right down to we need to work on for every subject in every grade. And we have school effectiveness frameworks, and we have district effectiveness frameworks, and we have effective teaching strategies. So the one thing that has been very, very helpful in our system is there is no controversy over what it is we're aspiring toward. But it is not so specific and prescriptive that there is not room for professional judgment. So in the old days when we taught grade three, it was prescribed that you did a unit on dinosaurs and here was the content. Not anymore. We have very clear descriptions of what it is we expect our students to know and be able to do. Now, having said that, we recognize that not every student can do all the same things on the same day in the same way. Thus, the professional judgment. We're the same with our leadership. We have a very clear description of what, and it's based on research, what effective leaders do. You have it in your package, and what I have up here are the domains of the leadership framework. So, within the realms of setting goals and building relationships and developing people, and certainly developing the organization to support desired outcomes and improving the instructional program. That's another one of those duhs, of course. And securing accountability. But we don't talk about securing accountability as inspections with checklists. I want to emphasize that one very clearly because I know that there's some um, discussions going on in Peru about what accountability looks like. So in your package, I think you have a leadership framework. And when you first look at it, does everybody have that in their package? It's in Spanish. Manuel had it translated for you. We know you can't read that slide, though, by the way. Just to be clear, we don't expect you to have eyeglasses that can see that. But you do have a print copy in your package. And the reason I want you to have a quick look at that is so that you can see how helpful that is when you're trying to figure out what should I be doing in my school. I suspect that every one of you in this room is a leader. You don't really know what the definition of leadership is. And you know that you have influence over others, but you, you could not perhaps clearly identify what you do next Thursday morning, perhaps in your institution, that says, ha, that made me a leader. So what we've given to you is a description, a very clear description, and Joni, if you go to her session next, um, I guess you'll all be going to her session next, is going to go into this much deeper. But what I want to emphasize is how this is not a prescription for an inspection and a checklist. It's how we determine, both on a personal level and in a collaborative growth accountability process, what we're doing well and where we want to spend some time, energy, and money in getting better. So have a quick look at that chart in your package and just underline two areas where you can confidently say about yourself, yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I can do that. But also have another look and find one area where you say to yourself, uh, that's not so hard. I need to work on that. I just want you to be exposed to the leadership framework. I want you to have an idea how we secure accountability. Is everybody finding the chart? Oh, it's very tiny. Oh, sorry. I thought it was supposed to be a placemat. 
Never mind. <laughs> Uh, maybe we can, what we can do is we'll put it up, uh, we'll get Manuel to put it up on the website, and then you can look at it. They have a big one? Yeah. It's too small though, is it? Okay. Anyway, if you can read it, <laughs> I don't want to waste too much time on this. If you can read it, have a look at it. Yes, thanks. Okay. Perfect. Have a look at it, and the whole purpose of this is, as I said, to realize how we have behaviors and actions identified as being associated with effective leaders, and it's meant to be a growth model. We do not expect all leaders in our system to do each of those behaviors on a daily basis. It's meant to be an exemplar. It's meant to be what you work toward. And it's meant to be the catalyst for the conversations you have with others to describe your practice, what you're doing well. So any one of those behaviors is a good description of what you do well, and you have a conversation about that, what you do in your building, and then it's also meant to be an, a, a conversation for where you want to improve. To emphasize to you that that's how we secure accountability. But of course we know that leadership is a much more complex and um, much more personalized behavior. So let's talk about some of those uh, more individual resources that we have within ourselves as leaders that can be leveraged as we work as a formal or informal leader in our schools. And if you look at this list, I think that you may be able to recognize within yourself some innate qualities that you have that perhaps you developed or fostered over time in each one of these areas. Today, obviously, we are talking about systems thinking and falling in that cognitive category. Uh, one of the reasons that I think that's important is because this is uh, a muscle that needs to be stretched for many of us. And I think that in Ontario, in the work that has been done, at every level, the challenge to all of us has been to be systems thinkers. So if you are a teacher in your classroom, how does it connect with the overall system goals and priorities, which should be obviously well aligned with the goals and priorities that have been articulated within your school or your group of schools, your district, etc. So the systems thinking piece was something that's been actively fostered and developed. But the other uh, resources that we have in cognitive and social and psychological are things that we can practice and develop as well through mentorship, through reflection, and through experience over time. Uh, one more thing I wanted to highlight about systems thinking is that you actually have a great metaphor and example from what your Minister of Education spoke about uh, today. He used the metaphor of the car, and you have four wheels of the car. That is your gift, I think, in terms of systems thinking, because he has articulated very clearly that those are the priorities for everyone. And I heard a call to action uh, around everyone connecting their work to those four wheels on the car to move everything forward. So to me, that was a great example of drawing all of you into the systems thinking that he was prioritizing for, for you. But let's also talk about where that rubber hits the road. Uh, Joanne and I were working together on preparing this, and the leadership framework, which we heard from this group, is very tiny, uh, com complex. Uh, and, and is a great anchor to go back to, a great conversation starter, uh, a great framework to use in work together as a team. Uh, but sometimes we also need to anchor in uh, simpler 
forms of, of reflection and, and content. So Joanne and I were talking about the fact that these five leadership capacities are really a distillation of some of the key qualities that you see in that leadership framework. So I know uh, in schools in Ontario, these have been the five key practices that have been developed, that have been emphasized, that have been fostered for leaders very actively in the work that's been done. And uh, Joanne said to me, you know, if you're going to put your time, energy, and money in something, you need to put it in these capacities. And, uh, and I think one of the net results of setting goals, aligning priorities, promoting collaborative cultures, using data, and having those courageous conversations is that the school culture shifts. And one of the things that I would encourage you to think about and look at in terms of school culture is actually intangibles. Uh, when we were doing some work in our organization several years ago, and I had a clear goal for some of the things that I wanted to see shift in the organization, I knew I was making progress when an outsider came to our organization and said, I can't tell what it is, but something's different around here. And I said, ah, okay, that's the culture shift we've been working on. And so then it was an opportunity to dig deeper, to understand what she saw, and also to see if there was a learning opportunity. So uh, goals obviously can be well anchored in the overall systems thinking and priorities within your school. And then as a school leader or even as a system leader, aligning resources and priorities to that is, is a key, key focus. And in our organization, and Anita Sherwin-Hamer, who you'll hear from tomorrow, this is something in our leadership team that we challenge each other's thinking on this a lot. What do we need to do to it? What do we need to invest in order to achieve the goals that we've set? And that's a very fine balance. And we've had to actually have some courageous conversations about that. And we are continuing to do that because it's a constant recalibration of aligning our resources and priorities with our goals. Uh, I think you've heard and will continue to hear quite a bit about collaborative learning cultures, but this has been, I think, one of the most significant shifts that teachers would report in Ontario, <laughs> is that no longer do teachers work uh, in isolation. They plan together, they teach together, they review data together, they talk together about what assessment results mean, and Anita will actually be talking about assessment tomorrow. So now it's very much a part of our school cultures and a part of teacher practice to work together with the principal, to work together with their peers and colleagues using data uh, to inform decisions and to move forward together. And that's where those courageous conversations are required. Uh, I'm sure you could ask the three women here from Ontario who have all been principals about some tough conversations that they've had to have with people about what the data told them or what might be required in order to move the school forward. So we've been talking about systemness and how everyone within the system has a shared responsibility for the success. And it was encouraging to hear your minister this morning say it's going to be a shared responsibility. Not one person can lead the charge. It's like the, the old adage of if you think you're a leader, you better look behind you and see if there's anybody behind you back there because you're not much of a leader unless you're leading with people. You may be familiar with a report that came out in 2010, and it was from McKinsey, and it was to evaluate globally, around the world, the kinds of things that school systems that are moving forward do. And they were common to all school systems. It didn't matter if they were moving from poor to fair, or fair to good, or good to excellent, or good to great, and then great to excellent. They're, these were the common phenomena that good systems put in place. 
Ontario in that process was part of the study and we were deemed to be going from great, having gone from good to great and in the process now of going from great to excellence. And one of the things that has been an added pressure for all of us in leadership positions in Ontario is the responsibility. We all felt overwhelmed and joyous when we went from good to great. Okay, pressure's on now. How are we going to go from great to excellent? And what does that look like? So what I want you to do right now is be thinking about your system, whether it's the Peruvian general public system or it's are you working in the private system? And I know that they are both very big factors in the Peru education sector. But be thinking about where in Peru the status of these qualities are. The first one is a small number of ambitious goals. We had three goals for over 10 years. And everybody in the system, the caretakers at the school, most of the students, and certainly all of the educators in the system could tell you that we were working to raise the bar on student learning. We were working to narrow the gap between the highest and the lowest performing students. And because our system was in such bad shape prior to 2002, we were focused on improving public confidence in the education system. As your minister said, Canada is one of the countries where public education is the norm. We don't have very many private schools because now, in 2016, there is a sense that the public system is serving the needs of our population. Hasn't always been like that. The private system was growing exponentially prior to 2000. So we needed to, for our system, emphasize public confidence, that public education, and I know that you're working on this here in Peru. So think about that for Peru. Small number of ambitious goals. Do you know what they are? Do you see yourselves being part of the achievement of them? The second one was a guiding coalition at the top. The fact that your minister was here this morning and spoke to you and put out a call to action to every one of you tells you that he knows he can't do it alone. You're all part of it. So what is that guy, who is that guiding coalition at the top? High standards and expectations. What do they look like? And we're talking about high standards for teacher performance, high standards for student performance, high standards for leadership performance, and that's why our frameworks, our exemplars, have really been a great motivator. We don't expect everybody to be performing up here, but we expect you to be working to get there. Mobilizing data and effective practices as a strategy for improvement. And again, that goes back to if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going, and you don't know how you're going to get there. So you have to know where you are. And that's the data, gathering the data. And once you know where you are, and you know where you want to get with those high expectations, then the pathway to get there becomes clearer, much more clear. Here's one that I think is makes Canada and um, certainly Ontario unique. We talk about intervention in a non-punitive manner. We have teachers who aren't very good. Let me just tell you that. I'm confessing in front of you, all of you. We have some principals who are downright crummy. We have directors of education that you, we all shake our heads and say, how did they get the job? But what's the response to poor performance? What's the response to people really don't cut the mustard? probably don't have that saying in Peru, but the response is the data says you're here. These are the things that aren't going so well. What are you going to do? How can I help? So as a principal, I had lots of teachers who were not really the best teachers in the whole world, but nevertheless, they were on my staff and they were darn well going to get better. And I was going to do whatever it took 
to get them better. Just as teachers have students in their class who aren't performing at their maximum level. But it takes per perseverance, it takes commitment, it takes passion. We believe that we have to intervene. We recognize poor performance when it's obvious, but it's in a non-punitive manner. You will get better, how can I help? And you will get better by this timeline. So it's very clear, but it's not negotiable. And of course, the last one, second two are kind of related. Reducing distractions, and you will not believe that a few years ago in our schools, we did a simple thing like declaring a period of time, first thing in the morning till school recess or the break in the morning, there would be no distractions. You know, as a principal, I would, Mrs. So-and-so would come in and say, I need to pick up Freddie because he has his music lesson, and I would get on the PA system and say, Freddie, come to the office, your mother's here. What does that do to that classroom? It, the kids that are there are now think, not thinking about the reading story that they're working on or the guided reading lesson the teacher's trying to pursue. They're thinking about how come he gets to go to a music lesson and I have to stay here. So we reduced the distractions. We made a declaration that the time from this time to this time there will be no interruptions. If a parent has to pick up a child from school to, for music lessons, it's very important that the child knows what time they have to come to the office because mom will be there to pick them up. And it's kind of tied to the last one, which sounds simple, but it's um, really, really important. Being transparent. So that means fessing up. Ooh, we're not very good at that. We know that. Being transparent. We're not very good at that, but we're working on it. <laughs> and of course, we're relentless, constantly pursuing excellence. One of the things that I like to talk about because of my role in leadership development in Ontario is the whole notion of leadership DNA. Again, Amy, how do you think about the leaders in your system? What did they do? How do you know they're a leader? What makes you admire them? So we talk about leadership DNA being the leaders who are dynamic, the leaders who are networked, they're not lone islands working on their own, and the leaders who are authentic. They're not trying to be anything but who they are. So we talk about that quite a bit, and we try to create learning environments where our students are ready for the future. We talk, you may be familiar with some of the work of um, Michael Fullen, and uh, actually Lynn Sherrod as well, where we talk about the fact that the students, and I heard others say it this morning, the student of today is not the student I taught when I first started teaching. I look at my grandchildren and what they do in their school and their assignments and what I used to have my students as a teacher do. There is not a lot of similarity. The tools are different. The learning expectations are different. The amount of collaborating is much enhanced. So we talk about the six C's of the students and their learning. We talk about being character. So we want students who have their own um, ability to be themselves and a strong moral character. Communication, critical thinking. Of course, with critical thinking goes problem solving. And much of our curriculum is based on real life problems and discussions and, and addressing those problems. Collaboration, and certainly creativity and imagination. So those are the six C's that have come out of the research. The other part of the research that I think you will be very interested in is knowing what motivates our students. And you may be familiar with a researcher out of the US, and I forget what university she's at, I'm sorry, but Kathleen Cushman. She, if 
you want to know what students want to know or want to learn, why wouldn't you ask them? And that's exactly what she did. She talked to the students in their learning environments, in their schools, and said, what makes you like learning? What keeps you motivated? And here the list, and you would be able to make the same list, I'm sure. They want social learning with others. You always have that one student who is really above average who says, I don't want to work with those people, with those other students. They drag me down. They prevent me from learning. But that's a learning experiment or a learning environment in and of itself. Being able to learn with others, and even if it means in some students' cases, uh, helping others learn, that's a whole citizenship quality that we need to foster. Links to the student's own interests. So that becomes the professional judgment of the people in classrooms, teachers. Being able to facilitate learning, but make it uh, about the students and their own interests. And just like Canada, Peru is a highly diverse, multicultural environment. It's a country where people from all, cult many cultures, are working side by side. So we have to appreciate that and recognize those cultural connections. No surprise that students want physical activity. And there is lots of research out there that identifies that Students who are more physically fit are also more academically fit. I always qualify the next one and say competition, or sorry, first of all, um, relevance to the larger world. How many times in your um, algebra class when you were in secondary school did you say, I certainly did. Why do I need to know this? I'll never use this. Uh, certainly calculus classes, I said that on a daily basis. But the, so we have to recognize that students need to see what it, what, how it's relevant to them. I always qualify the next one and say friendly competition. It's good to have competition, but make sure it doesn't go over the top. Obviously, choice and curiosity, sort of that problem solving, puzzle solving um, way of teaching. So I think it's important that we know, because this is a well-researched study, what motivates our students. Think about your own classrooms. Think about your own, your own practice. Are you nurturing those things? Sort of in line with the same idea of Michael Fullan's six C's, we have some research here by another one of our colleagues, Dr. Lynn Sherrod, and she has done a whole book, um, Good to Great to Innovate. So part of her work has been on what are the practices that we put in place when we're looking to develop those innovative learning environments for students. And you can see that she has not pulled these uh, innovative mindset qualities out of the hat. They come from many well-researched resources. And so the innovative mindset, much like Carol Dweck's growth mindset, it talks about the skills um, that are common and best aligned with the demands of the workplace. So we want our students ready for their own future. And this is what we have to do. So. Um, Amy, I know that you work with teachers and you certainly are um, very involved in innovation in teaching practice. Can you give us some examples of looking at those innovative mindset where um, critical thinking and uh, curiosity, creativity, and collaborative approaches exist in our classrooms and in our schools? Sure. Thanks, uh, Joanne. You know, you talked in the previous slide about relevance to the larger world or relevance to the real world. And I think that all of this innovation, innovation mindset, uh, all of these descriptors are really tied to that core desire that our students have around connecting with the real world. And one of the ways that we've seen this implemented very successfully is with project-based learning 
where students get to work on a project that they define and construct with their teacher and their peers, and they get to connect with the connect the, connect the curriculum requirements with real projects that they get to work on. For example, we have many programs in our schools now that allow students to be entrepreneurial, where students get to look at uh, a full life cycle of an idea and how it might turn into a business concept, for example. Uh, students get to experiment, and in fact, tomorrow um, I'll be talking about flipped classrooms, and one of the benefits of a flipped classroom where the core content is actually delivered outside of the class time, it allows students to come in and practice and play. And in my workshop on Thursday, I'll have the opportunity to share a video of a chemistry class. Now, chemistry, I think, has often been a place where students have been able to experiment. But what these students are able to do in this class is be creative about designing their own experiments because they've learned about the content themselves already. And then they come in with that sense of curiosity. Well, I wonder if this would work. And they need a responsible guide who's going to make sure that it's not a dangerous situation for them. But they get to explore the concepts, challenge their own thinking, test an idea. And so it evokes all of those kinds of things around curiosity creativity, critical thinking, and they have a responsibility to bring that back to the core content and concepts um, that have been introduced. So we see this happening across subjects in math, in, in language. In language, there's so many opportunities to do this. Uh, students now are collaboratively creating content all the time and going well beyond just writing a story where students have the opportunity to create multimedia projects and tell a story where they're using digital di di different digital formats and where they are working together to co-construct the content, give each other feedback, and then work together in creating a final version. There's so many examples of where students get to take real ownership of their work and be innovative in that place. And, and that really ties in with a concept uh, that you may hear about quite a bit over the next few days, and that is around deeper learning. Uh, this is a topic that has come up quite a bit, Joanne. You talked about the six C's. I'm going to talk about the six C's tomorrow as well. And I think that the benefit of innovation in deeper learning is that we provide the opportunity for for experimentation and to understand concepts or ideas or uh, opinions from a different perspective. And this is one of the uh, core priorities that, uh, that, we, that we need to have is creating a space where failure or perhaps things not going as expected can exist. That's really required in a, in a context of innovation. And, uh, we actually just had in our organization an innovation challenge. And I had no idea how this was going to go. Each week we tried to do something with the staff where we got some energy going and reminded them that this was coming. But the basic practice for our innovation challenge was um, that they needed to come forward with an idea that would improve the way that we work, the way that we work together, um, whether it's process, practice, resources. And the only parameters I put around it was that the maximum budget was $5,000, which was a lot of money, really, to be able to say, you can actually ask for something where we'll write a check to make it happen. And I had no idea if people would come. And it was amazing because we had six submissions in an organization of 15 people, which I was thrilled with. And now we have two winning projects that came out of those submissions. And that was a really scary thing for me to, to do because I thought, we're going to do this innovation we're challenge, we're going to call people to action, and what if they don't come? I was really nervous about that. 
but it was absolutely worth it to try because even if they hadn't come, then we could have had a, com a courageous conversation about, so why didn't you participate? Were there barriers to participation that we need to eliminate? And even with uh, taking this on, uh, we can move forward and uh, try a different approach for another innovation challenge. So another aspect of deeper learning, which we've already touched on, is creativity and how we generate ideas, how we make connections, and how we facilitate growth. And I think that an innovation mindset is really key here because in order to foster creativity amongst your staff, amongst your students, we have to be open to multiple possibilities. And I would say for me as a leader, this is also a challenge because sometimes when I start something, I have this idea of how I want it to go. The Innovation Challenge is actually an example of that. But if I can push myself to step back and let other people take ownership, let other people be a part of that process and guide what it will look like and what the outcomes will be, then we can get something way more creative going than I could come up with myself. I really didn't know what those ideas would be and I was blown away by the diversity of perspectives and in that instance, even though we only had the two winning projects, we have applied that learning to look at, huh, there's some other feedback we got from the staff about what they need and can we find another way to address that? Can we get creative and engage those people in a dialogue because they're telling us there's another way to get at this, another way that we need support. <clears throat> and then finally, entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, which I want to touch on. You know, I think this is one of the most significant changes that I have observed in education uh, as a part of this process that perhaps wasn't an intentional byproduct, but has been an amazing evolution in the education system. Uh, where we, we provide the opportunity for um, activities that are scalable and can be sustainable and we're looking at real world problems uh, where students come up with ideas and they have the opportunity to see them through. And uh, we have been blown away by some of the projects that we have been able to be a part of where we have helped connect schools who have an idea with the resources that they need. And one of the best examples that I can give you here around entrepreneurship is uh, we had a classroom of schools, uh, or a classroom in a school who asked for um, prosthetic robotics. And they wanted to see if they could design prosthetics for people who were perhaps missing part of their arm. Uh, and see if they could design a better model of prosthetics because in their community this was a real issue. They live in a farming community where on occasion there are accidents and so they see people in their community who have prosthetics and they also see in their community the limitations of those prosthetics. And so we don't know where this will go for these students but what they are trying to do is experiment they're fulfilling aspects of the curriculum, they're failing through this process, learning from those failures, and then trying something new. And who knows, maybe they'll have something that they can sell in the end. They're motivated by that prospect, not so much of the entrepreneurial piece, but of making an impact. And this is a big change that I think we see in our schools today, is that students want to be part of projects and processes that can make an impact on the communities that they live that they live in and if they can do that in a way that perhaps turns into a business all the better just to bring it back to once again some research that came out of OECD and I keep bringing it back to some of the research because it is important to guide our systems to where we they will provide, be providing the future for our students. But we have to do it knowing that the focus that we have is going to be worthwhile. So again, from out of OECD, we have this image here of the old-fashioned schoolhouse. But what does it look like in the future? And what do leaders, and again, I don't mean necessarily 
just people who have the job called principal or leader, but people who have the influence throughout the system, what is the impact of that school leadership and what does the future hold? Now I want you to be thinking about this for Peru because you're the professionals who came to an event like this who are going to be thinking and shaping the future of education in Peru. So what does it look like when you think of innovative learning environments? What does that look like in Peru in the future? Innovative learning environments. And what confident teachers. Now we've talked a lot about the importance of teachers and school leaders working together to move a whole system forward. What do confident teachers look like and act like? And think about the teachers, or if you are a teacher, think about yourself. What do, what's the difference between where you are now and that level of confidence? And of course, effective school leaders. Now, normally we would make this into a little conversation time where you would do the turn and talk so that this group might be having some conversation about what, what does innovative learning environment in Peru look like in the future? And what does confident teaching look like in the future? But we don't want to, um, we want you to have that conversation over coffee when we get to the break. And we'll move on then to what do the competencies of leadership look like? So, I want to give you, I'm assuming you are all leaders. Am I right? You think so Whether you think you are or not, you are all leaders in this room. So I want to give you, I see the next list there. I want you to give yourself a score. One is, yes, I am really good at that. Two is, yeah, I'm okay. And number three is, that terrifies me. I don't do that at all. So one, and it's about you. Two, one is, I got this one. I got it. Number two is, uh, maybe, maybe not. Some days, some yes, some days, no. And number three is, I, I haven't gotten there yet. So look at what we know, th again, through the research, that are associated with leadership, the competencies. How well do you challenge the status quo? Are you one of the people? You can do that in a quiet, respectful way, by the way. You don't have to come in pounding with fists on the table saying, this will never work. We all have worked with people that are like that. We know that that doesn't have a very positive effect. How are you at building trust through clear communications and expectations? People know who you are, they know what to expect, and you are clear about what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. Give yourself a one, a two, or a three. How well do you create a commonly owned plan for success? In other words, it's one thing to have a vision, mission, we've all done these over the years, mission, vision, and goals, and it's in a little plaque on the wall, and we, but there, Michael Fullen always says there's sort of a reverse association, or a re reverse uh, association with how well your strategic plan, or how thick your strategic plan is, compared to how much you actually get done. The thicker the plan, the less you succeed at getting done. <laughs> So how well do you create that commonly owned plan for success? Do you focus on team over yourself? You know that uh, phrase that there's no I in the word team? Probably doesn't translate. Amy's what I'm saying. Oh well. Do you have a high sense of urgency to change and sustainable results in improving student achievement? In other words, We've got to get this done. Back in 2002 in Ontario, we had a Minister of Education who said, we have a crisis. And we did. Our, do you have that sense of urgency? But then, of course, with that comes, what are we going to do about it? Commitment to continuous improvement for self and your organization. 
builds external networks and partnerships. Again, the more your parents, your community, uh, your um, stakeholder groups are involved, the higher the rate of success. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many of you got 21? In other words, you're working on all of them. And then the uh, next page is all related to, and uh, I'm just going to talk about this briefly, it's meta-analysis that was done by Vivianne Robinson. I'd like to say she's my sister, but she wasn't. That uh, She's out of University of Auckland, and she did a meta-analysis of the behaviors that are most closely associated to leadership and to um, effective student learning. So you'll get a, this in a much more detail with Joni Hurd's presentation. But her meta-analysis came up with these, these five, these four. The ability to apply relevant knowledge to the appropriate situation. And again, you could give yourself a one, two, or three on that one as well. Taking complex problems and seriously engaging others in the solutions. Mentoring and coaching others and uh, certainly building relationship trust or having your relations uh, with your part of a team as opposed to an independent. So those are, that's some um, what I would call global research to inform you in your own self-analysis. So the last piece we want to emphasize is around extraordinary leadership. And uh, Joanne and I had a nice conversation about the importance of grit. Uh, raise your hand, please, if you're in a leadership role and you have ever felt that you've had, you've had to dig really deep to push through a challenge or a crisis in some way. Who's had to do that? Really look within yourself, find your internal resources, I think whether it's personal or professional, we've all had those opportunities. And when we're talking about grit, we are dig talking about digging deep. We're talking about doing whatever it takes. And when it comes to leadership grit, we're talking about uh, getting your team to do that through motivation, through empowerment, through setting those goals and raising that bar for everyone. And in fact, I thought about grit when your Minister of Education was talking about the difference between schools. Maybe they, maybe they have the same circumstances, the same resources, but one is seeing more success than the other. And I think perhaps one of the things that makes a difference in those schools is around leadership grit. So let's talk about what those dimensions are very briefly as we wrap things up. First, we need to look at growth. So we, this is about looking at things differently, seeing things from different perspectives, looking at alternatives and different approaches. So the courageous conversations that we talked about earlier would uh, support this growth piece. So if you're uh, doing some self-reflection, this is another place where you could give yourself a one, two, or three, or even just make a note to yourself of, huh, that's something I might want to observe or reflect in myself and, uh, and see if I want to put some attention to it. The next aspect is around resilience. And I am sure everyone in this room has had one of those really tough days, either because the circumstances of your experience were difficult or because things perhaps didn't go as well as you would have hoped. And in those moments, it's resilience that allows you to respond constructively and helps you stand up to that adversity and move forward, hopefully having learned something for the next time. Then instinct. And this is a really interesting one because we've emphasized the importance of data. And so there's that question for me of, where do instinct and data come into play together? And so I think you know, part of this is about knowing that sometimes you just have to listen to your gut. I'm assuming you have some kind of similar expression to listening to your gut. And so we all have those moments where we need to respond. And the gut instinct can help you with that. And then the data can help inform you on the go forward 
if you need to recalibrate or you need to shift direction over time. So don't discount the importance of gut instinct, but try and avoid letting gut instinct uh, being your only guide. It has to be the balance of both and knowing when that timing is. And then we have tenacity and robustness. Who can relate to this one? Who feels as an educator that a little bit of tenacity is required? <laughs> Manuel's raising his hand because we know he's been so tenacious in organizing all of this. You know, we have to, we're running a marathon here. This is not a sprint in your careers, with your students, in your schools. That tenacity is required in order to connect your goals with your practice and in order to expand our thinking. That's why you're here. Usually we go to these types of events because we're looking to expand what we know, what we understand, our networks and our connections, and making a more robust set of perspectives that help to inform our work. So in closing, um, the one thing that we, I think we should emphasize is maybe some overall concepts of what we've been trying to emphasize this morning. Remember that together we represent system leadership. Leadership, whether it's the job called leader, principal, vice principal, or curriculum leader, or whether it's somebody who in the system, working with others, has a positive influence. So we talk about alignment, and that's something that drove a lot of what we did, but alignment is really about the structures. It's when we're actually working together, thinking together, and having our mindsets all working towards the same end, student learning. So coherence is about shared mindsets, and remembering that a tool is only as good as the mindset using it. And then the last concept here is, our job here is to emphasize that it's coherence in the system that is going to move your system forward. And so we talk about, again, small number of ambitious goals. You need to know what they are, and you need to know how you're going to contribute to the success. Focus on instruction and the student learning agenda, because it, it's about kids. If it's not about kids and it's not about learning, it's not important. Think about that phrase. Continuous capacity building, you're all part of that, and you have to can cultivate a system, cultivate a, Michael Fillon uses the word systemness. He made it up, but it's a good word. We all know what it means. It's about shared responsibility, and you're all part of it. So Amy and I wish you well in all of your endeavors in improving the system of education in Peru, and we're really excited to have been a part of it.